the secret message. She actually is um, generating two keys uh, from a large uh, random number. First, look into the quantum thread. So quantum, the thread of the quantum computer to secure communication, is it is it real or not? Uh, you might ask now, what, what should we do if you want to have a higher reach, 26 kilometers is not too much. Thank you. So actually, it's getting a bit more technical now, so I want to have a, a glimpse on, on the future of uh, security in, in networks. Uh, not just about quantum key distribution, but more, more about the general picture. And I would like to thank for the opportunity to, to give the talk here. Um, if you, you probably agree that uh, security in communication I is very important and that, that really doesn't stop just at uh, if you do some online shopping. So cryptographic functions are, are very important for many things in everyday life and uh, you want to wanna ensure that your, uh, your data can't be seen by anybody else. So you want to ensure confidentiality. You want to ensure integrity of the data so that nobody really can change your data and maybe just add a zero at the bank transfer you're just doing. And you want to make sure that uh, authenticity is ensured so that nobody can do some actions uh, on your behalf without you knowing it. And um, that doesn't stop uh, with uh, optical networks and probably, maybe you don't know, but actually it's not so difficult also to, to tap optical fiber. And what you can see here is a bending coupler. So you don't have to cut the optical fiber, you just uh, using a bending coupler that's a few hundred dollars and you can listen to all the traffic on, on the optical fiber. So essentially protection is equally also required on optical fiber. Uh, if we now look at uh, how to ensure confidentiality, that problem is very well understood actually. So what you can do or what you should do is you're introducing some encryption at the transmit side. So it's usually called Alice who is transmitting some information to Bob and uh, you're doing the encryption with a secret key and uh, Bob then can then uh, receive the ciphertext uh, and does the decryption with the same key. The only problem you have with, with this symmetric scheme is that actually you need kind of channel to transmit the secret key because the key is secret. Um, but what we actually want to do in practice is we want to transmit the key over a secure channel and uh, for for solving this problem uh, there is a very ingenious way to do it and that's actually called public key cryptography. So public key cryptography allows to initiate secure communication over a insecure channel. How does that work? Um, here are two, two pictures explaining it. So if Alice wants uh, that Bob can send her a secret message, she actually is um, generating two keys uh, from a large uh, random number. And uh, so she is generating a public key and a private key. And she is uh, transmitting the, private, the public key to Bob and then Bob is using the, using the public key to encrypt its information, uh, sends it over to Alice, and Alice is able with her private key to decrypt the information and uh, see the message. Um, for an RSA algorithm, which is probably the most well-known public key protocol, uh, the RSA algorithm is based on uh, two large prime factors that can be used to derive the secret key from the public key and the security is basically based on the difficulty to calculate the private key from the public without knowing the, these factors. So the, the problem you would have to solve to, uh, to crack the RSI is actually you would have to factorize the a very large integer number into its prime factors. And that is what gives the security for the public key system. Um, 
Now, since uh, most of this uh, security on in internet is, is based on this public key uh, cryptography, um, in August 2015 there came an announcement from the National Security Agency uh, which came to some surprise for most of the people and uh, uh, NSA recommended to prepare for the uh, upcoming quantum resistant algorithms and no longer to really invest in elliptic curve algorithm which were uh, recommended by NSA up, up to that time. That came to a surprise for many people and peop the people were arguing maybe NSA has already uh, a method to uh, to break this public key cryptographic algorithms uh, or maybe has built a large quantum computer to, to solve that problem. But actually, people really don't know and uh, it's more realistic scenario is actually that uh, NSA sees that there is some progress on quantum uh, computers uh, and uh, people should prepare for it. Um, in addition to that, uh, quantum research also gained uh, some momentum with new research projects. One of them, the Quantum Communication Hub in the UK, which uh, lasts five years with 24 million pound of funding and there was a launch of a European flagship project with up to one million of funding. China is also active. So that leads me to the outline of my talk. I want to first look into the quantum thread, so quantum, the thread of the quantum computer to secure communication. Is it is it real or not? Uh, we want to look into quantum key distribution, whether that's really the solution to protect against quantum computing. We want to then, uh, in the third step, to have a look at the bigger picture of quantum safe cryptography in general and then hopefully uh, see what, what's actually the best solution, the most secure option uh, to, for future uh, security. Uh, now the quantum thread, is it real? Um, public key cryptography, all widely used public key systems are basically rely on three algebraic problems. So the first one is interfactoring integer factoring, that's where RSA is based on. Then discrete logarithm, uh, for example, as basis of from Diffie-Hellman algorithm, and elliptic curve discrete logarithm for the elliptic curve cryptography. And basically all, all of these problems can be solved by a large quantum computer. So the guy who discovered that uh, on a theoretical basis, that's Mr. Shore here on the left, very friendly looking guy. Um, and now the question is, uh, how real is a large quantum computer? This is a quantum computer that looks like a physical experiment. Actually, it's uh, in the IBM labs. And it's, it's a, basically it's a, a structure that, uh, it's, that it's pending from the ceiling. And uh, in order to get it stable, to get it working, they have uh, uh, to use cooling with uh, liquid helium. Um, and uh, according to an article from, from IBM, um, IBM is suggesting that uh, on the current rates of progress, um, they believe that uh, scientific and technology challenges will be substantially addressed over the next 10 or may maybe 15 years. It doesn't, doesn't look so far off, uh, but now let's have a look at what, what uh, scientists really were able to do. Up to now they can stabilize maybe four to ten uh, quantum bits, uh, which is actually far too low to, to factor large, large semi-primes. So um, but now the question is what, what makes them believe that they actually uh, can go uh, can make progress within 10 or 15 years maybe one reason is really say uh, there is some work on quantum error correction and this quantum error correction basically leads to some kind of threshold effect once once you'll be able to uh, to take the error threshold low enough uh, with quantum error correction you really can uh, allow that that you can more easily scale uh, to a higher number of qubits uh, so now if you assume that uh, you have 10, maybe 15 years to, to address this challenge, um, 
you, of course, you need some time to update your infrastructure. Um, but there is a second point uh, that uh, addresses the question of how long you would, uh, w how long you want to ensure that uh, the, the information you send is actually secure. Um, and that uh, e essentially it's based on the, f on the attack scenario that uh, you can store the encrypted data now and decrypt it later when a quantum computer is available. This kind of attack is, is also called harvesting attack. Uh, and you probably will, uh, will agree that probably not everybody can do that, but there are some guys who can, yeah. So the most obvious solution maybe f to protect against quantum computing is uh, uh, so-called quantum key distribution. You probably have heard about it. Uh, it's uh, quite quite weird technology, and I want to make a kind of desperate attempt to to use four slides to explain what's quantum key distribution. So the first slide actually use uh, is some some introductory slide uh, with a bit of mathematics you need to to understand the basic principle. So in quantum communication, instead of bits, you're working with uh, quantum bits or qubits. And qubits mathematically can be described as a two-dimensional quantum state uh, in the Hilbert space. So you, you do have all orthogonal states. Uh, you might name them H or V or uh, plus or minus. And uh, the important thing is that it's uh, just two-dimensional. So um, if you have a, a different uh, or orthogonal basis of your two-dimensional state, for example, plus and minus, that's linear dependent from from another uh, orthogonal basis, H and V. Uh, and uh, you can see on the picture that it's uh, you have two-dimensional and it's linear dependent. And uh, now the most important thing about uh, this quantum key distribution is that if you um, observe a qubit that's defined over one basis, H, V, uh, and you detect it with a different basis, then essentially uh, it doesn't allow you. So the outcome will be basically random. That's uh, indicated by that, that equation that shows the probability to detect a one or a zero uh, with a different basis is essentially 0.5, so it's, it's random. And if we talk about uh, quantum key distribution, so we are usually looking into single photons for transmitting the qubits. So now this is uh, one, so the simplest protocol BB called PB84 that looks at quantum key distribution. So we want to transmit the, uh, or generate the, uh, the key uh, with Alice transmitting single photons to Bob and Alice is preparing the photons either on one basis or on the other basis and you are transmitting uh, either horizontal or vertical is zero and one or diagonal is zero and one and Bob is detecting uh, this uh, single photons with a random basis. So Bob is uh, selecting his basis independently of Alice and then they're doing a, a row of transmission and only if Bob uh, by chance is choosing the same basis like Alice used for preparing it, uh, he will detect the correct state, the correct one or a zero and if he is uh, choosing the wrong basis it's, uh, the outcome will be random. And after, after doing the transmission, Bob, Alice and Bob over a public channel, they are uh, comparing what basis they were using and they are um, sorting out those bits that are actually, uh, can be detected correctly and leaving out those where the basis was uh, selected wrongly. This last step, that's the last line, it's actually called uh, sifting stage. And now if you uh, think of an eavesdropper, that's, uh, that's a small devil called Eve here in the picture. So if Eve tries to eavesdropping some of the information, okay, <laughs> of the information, then uh, uh, you will have the situation that uh, the error rate is increasing and uh, you can detect if uh, if you're if you're crossing a certain error rate in this uh, in this transmission, so for a 
a real quantum key distribution system, you have to take into account that there can be also normal transmission errors. So you're transmitting over a system, you, you're transmitting uh, single photons over that system. Um, th it might happen that the photon doesn't arrive because uh, you have some attenuation over, over the signal. Um, so essentially you have to correct uh, for so, those errors and it's very important that uh, the errors uh, uh, you get from transmission can't really be distinguished from, from eavesdropping. So that gives rise to a certain reach limitation of the system. Um, and um, based on all this, uh, on the estimation of the error rate and on the leakage during this error correction, you have to do as a last step, you have so-called privacy amplification to make sure that uh, the key is compressed uh, uh, so much that uh, uh, possibly attacker cannot have any information on the, on the key. So now let's look at uh, what, what you can do with this kind of system. So the graph shows uh, the key rate you can transmit over a certain fiber length. Uh, and um, so the graph shows three different cases. So the solid line is actually uh, the key rate you can achieve uh, if you have an ideal single photon source um, that transmits just one photon uh, per event. Uh, but in reality, uh, if, you, if you use a real laser, so it's uh, more likely Poisson distributed as, as it's shown by, by the small, small graph here. So you cannot ensure that you actually just always transmit one photon. It's no photon in, in many cases. It can be one, it can be two. You have some distribution. And that actually leads uh, to uh, quite some reduction in, uh, in, the, in the reach you can have. Uh, that's actually the blue line in the graph, so it's just a little bit more over 20 kilometers then. But uh, there are some means to increase the rate also for real, uh, for real sources. And uh, what's shown here in the dashed line is actually so-called Tissot state uh, 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 variant where you use a kind of Tissot state sequence for bounding the transmission performance to uh, to increase the reach then for this protocol. So, from a from a more practical point of view, you probably can can achieve 100 kilometers or so. Uh, Adfa has done a field trial uh, together with British Telecom and and Toshiba, uh, looking into quantum key distribution over a WDM system. So uh, we provided a, a WDM system with four times 10 gigabit. Uh, transmission capacity and in, in contrast to many other experiments done, uh, we transmitted the quantum key over the same fiber, so it's not a separate fiber, it's the same fiber, which uh, is a problem because uh, you get quite some nonlinear distortions to the very weak quantum channel. And what you can see then, uh, it was a, a loopback experiment with 26 kilometers, approximately 10 dB loss. And uh, then we uh, we estimated what uh, how many channels you can transmit and what would be the final key rate, and that's something you can see on the on the right graph. So um, if you scale up to the four channels to 40 channels or to 80 channels, you still can uh, achieve a reasonable key rate uh, that's necessary for 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 a key. Uh, for, for the key you need for AES encryption. So it's not, just looks quite promising actually. Uh, you might ask now, what, what should we do if you wanna have a higher reach, 26 kilometers is not too much. So what you really have to do that, and, and China already did it, they have a large scale quantum key distribution network. You have to introduce some trusted node uh, and uh, with a trusted node you're able to, uh, to do two independent QQD connections and uh, you can uh, generate the same key at both ends. Um, but the, the disadvantage obviously is you need, you need some trusted node in between uh, and within the trusted node uh, you can access the real key. So you have to ensure that nobody can access it. Actually that's also a technique that works with satellites. Uh, uh, and the advantage with satellites is probably is that uh, it's not so easy to access the trusted node. So what are 
the pros and cons now for quantum key distribution. So QKD provides the ultimate security probably uh, because it doesn't rely on the hardness of, of certain computational problems. But obviously we have seen already some disadvantages, the decreasing key rate with distance. You might have to introduce trusted nodes, which is not nice. And it's basically it's a physical layer technique. So, so it's, it's relatively high complex uh, at the moment, implementations are still bulky, and it's not not really a one-to-one -one replacement of, of current protocols. So then, um, therefore, I wanna wanna have a bit of look at uh, at the bigger picture, not just at QKD, but at quantum safe cryptography in general. So if you wanna classify cryptographic algorithms according to whether they are quantum secure or not, then you have uh, here on the right side you have the Algorithms, the known algorithm, RSA, Diffie, Hellman, public key algorithm, ECC, that are based on computational security. And on the left side, the blue one, you have uh, algorithms, uh, so called information, uh, provide information theoretic security, which is not based on some computational problem. Uh, the uh, most well-known uh, sort of this information theoretic security is so called one-time pad. Uh, and now, uh, if you want to sort in QKD, QKD belongs to the information se theoretic security. There's a more general class of um, security protocols that's known as physical layer security. It's essentially based on the fact that um, you ensure that uh, Bob has some channel advantage over Eve. Uh, to ensure the security. There's also another class that's uh, from the from network coding, uh, which ensures uh, information theoretic security if you assume that the attacker doesn't have access to, to all of the connections in a network. Uh, and uh, now the red um, line shows uh, all of this information theoretic security is actually quantum safe. Uh, it belongs to the quantum safe cryptography class, but there is a a group of algorithms who are quantum safe, but actually belong to the uh, rely on computational security. And those kind of algorithms, they are uh, there is a long list of suggestions for those algorithms. Uh, uh, maybe most well known, it's the Magellis algorithm. Uh, and there are there are others who um, really belong to uh, rely on computational security, but are quantum safe. The the latest uh, version is so-called New Hope algorithms, which you can try yourself. You have to download the uh, the beta version of Google Chrome, and if you're lucky, then it actually will uh, uh, use a quantum safe uh, algorithms for for connecting to the Google servers. Uh, yeah. uh, the quantum safe cryptography algorithms you have, um, it belongs to, to different uh, kind, so, so you rely on a different kind of problems which are not easy to solve uh, with a quantum computer. So the quantum computer does not really have to solve these problems. And uh, there are different classes of problems, lattice-based, uh, code-based, so based on forward error corrections, so the McEllis uh, a cryptographic system uh, based on, on on forward error correcting codes, multivariate polynomials or hash based signatures. Uh, one problem of this kind of algorithms, the Megalis one is probably the, uh, the one which is best understood. Um, it exists since the 70s. Uh, one problem of this is, as you can see on the public key side, the public key side is is much much larger, much bigger than what you what you have for the RSE, for example. That might be not a problem for optical networks. If you're transmitting 10 or 100 G, then then you probably can can afford to have a, a bigger public key size. But uh, of course, it's something you have to take in into consideration. None of those algorithms is actually standardized, so we shouldn't expect any standard before maybe 20, uh, 23 or 20 uh, up to 25. But um, uh, they are working on it. So now, having a comparison between QKD and uh, this post-quantum cryptography or quantum-safe cryptography, um, 
The differences are uh, for, for the algorithmic approaches, you really rely on the hardness of certain computational problems. So you do have some vulnerability if computing power increases, standard computing power increases, and uh, there might be also some clever mathematician coming up with a new solution to, to that problem. And you don't have any proof of, of the security. On contrast for QKD, is security is really based on some, some quantum property. Uh, you don't rely on any computational assumptions uh, and um, that actually if you look at this, uh, it QKD uh, looks more secure, but, but the question is what, uh, if you look in practice, what's, what's actually more secure and uh, for this I, I had a look on the on three serious encryption problems you had for, for classical encryption in 2014. Uh, there is this so-called heartbleed uh, bug for in the OpenSSL software. There is this infamous go fail error from, from Apple. And if you look at this, uh, you can see that uh, mostly the problem is not, not the algorithm, it's, it's implementation, so, so bugs in the implementation. And that's not very different to QKD implementation. There's a long list of implementation errors people have found and have corrected, of course, but um, you always, you always get uh, problems with the implementation. Um, therefore, the good news that comes now, maybe you don't have to decide for one option or for the other option. Maybe you just take both, you just combine it, and that's a good thing. You can combine uh, the key for two different public key systems in an XOR operation, and the combined key is least as random as, as uh, the individual keys. So you really can have a certified solution with a standard public key uh, system and you can add a QKD system, which is, of course, it's not certified, but it, it adds some, some additional security. That leads me to uh, my conclusions. So we have seen that quantum computers actually can threaten current key exchange algorithms, maybe not, not in two years, maybe 15 years, maybe it takes a bit longer. Uh, QKD certainly offers uh, a solution for this and the promise of absolute security, but there are alternatives, so-called quantum safe public key protocols. And uh, the good news is that you really don't have to decide for one side or for the other. You simply can combine it by a bitwise XOR operation, combine these keys. And that's probably a lection we, we learned from, from the vulnerability of of classic public key algorithms. Maybe it's really better to, uh, to base the security on two key distribution algorithms which are fundamentally very different. So you have the algorithm approach and you have the QKD approach and uh, that probably gives you the, the best security you, you can hope for. But uh, if you combine it, you, you really have to, to take attention that you, you do it right. So thank you very much. Questions. You mentioned the, the fact that most problems, most actual problems are in implementation, not algorithm. It's the thing that bothers me with quantum safe computing or quantum computing from the beginning. In a, in a typical security system, the algorithm is only a very small part and it's already the most secure part. So I have the feeling that everything quantum safe is trying to strengthen the uh, link which is already the strongest one in most security systems. Isn't it your analysis? That's a very good question and actually I have a slide for this. <laughs> uh, this is a quote from, from Bruce Schneier who on his uh, internet page put uh, exactly the same message. So if you if you want to secure your system, you actually have to, to it, it doesn't really help to, to strengthen the strongest part of, of your system. And you might argue that um, um, the encryption part with the algorithms we actually use now is really one of the strongest part and, and probably security issues are, are more likely in other parts. But uh, um, he's certainly right uh, if you don't have a quantum computer. So if you have a quantum computer, it's actually, if you have a large scale quantum computer, it's act, uh, actually very easy to break this standard 
public key systems, and then then the uh, quantum safe algorithms came into play. Any other questions? If not, thanks again for your presentation and thanks for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, next talk is uh, from uh, from Simon. <laughs>